welcome to the latest in the series of video presentations from the Perfect Railway Circle. We hope you are enjoying these. Please remember to like and share the videos and also to click on the bell icon to get all the latest news. Please note that all photographs are used under license to Perfect Railway Circle and that you are unable to share, distribute and copy without first seeking permission. Tonight we have a presentation from Mike Walshaw, signalman on the Swanage Railway and part of the Project Wareham team, to give you an insight into how much work was required to restore the link to Wareham. Now this slide emphasises uh, that it was going to be a bit of a challenge for a heritage railway like the Swanage to work with network rail, especially to, de to design and install a signalling system to professional standards, of course, connecting a 1950s era signal box with a state-of-the-art signalling centre over 70 miles away. Now, the title of my talk includes the word upgrading and uh, that's to do with the infrastructure. So in this picture we could see no less than three diesel locomotives that were involved when Network Rail renewed the worn out points at Wurgrut Junction in December 2012. This is located just a mile west of Wareham Station um, and is where the single line Swanage branch line peels off to the left and aims southeastwards to Corf Castle and Swanage while the electrified main line bears off towards Wool and to the west. Now it's been a long held aspiration of the Swanage Railway to operate a passenger service between Swanage and Wareham. But of course, our heritage service between Norden or Purbeck Park, as it is now called, and Swanage will always be our bread and butter and our raison d'etre. This picture from our 2018 diesel gala shows our class 33 diesel loco propelling a 4TC set from Swanage to Wareham. It's an absolutely classic photographic location between Corf Castle and Norden Station. Our second aspiration was to be able to offer attractive destinations for special trains to visit off the national network. Here is Andrew Wright's superb photo of, photograph of Tornado on a charter train from London to Swanage on the 16th of June, 2010. The location, of course, is south of Corf Castle on the climb up to Afflington Road Overbridge. Now, I must tell you um, how it came about that we were able to turn our aspirations into reality. You see, the chance in a lifetime came in 2008 when Network Rail decided to re signal the line between Poole and Wool. This provided us with the opportunity to design and commission a properly signal link from the main line at Wurgra Junction down to Norden and thence down to Corf Castle and Swanage. This would be done in conjunction with Network Rail's much bigger re signaling project and at a very modest cost of several million pounds, largely funded from Dorset County Council's transportation budget. Now, my presentation will cover five key engineering elements, as I call them. Here are the first two. The first is Network Rail's pool to wool resignaling project, which I've already mentioned. Now the track that we took over from Network Rail was not in the best of condition for running passenger trains. In fact, it was classed as a goods line. So we ha had to undertake two key infrastructure upgrades. The first was to strengthen the slipped embankment on the Swanley side of Fursbrook. And the second 
was to relay some worn out track on the other side of Fursbrook. Here are the last three engineering elements that I want to cover. Uh, we needed a new road rail interchange facility at Norden, and I will tell you why later. And as an amateur signal engineer, I look forward to telling you about the token block signaling scheme that we designed and installed. And lastly, we had to modernize the existing rather primitive level crossing at Norden. So let's first have a look at Network Rail's pool to wool resignaling project, the first of my five engineering elements. This saw the closure of all four mechanical signal boxes on the main line, so I will show you them in turn. We'll start with pool signal box and work our way down the line to wool. So this is an exterior view taken around 2011 when a party of Swanage Railway signalmen visited the signal boxes hosted by our signalling inspector. This is the interior of Poole signal box and Poole station is at the right hand end of the large track and signal diagram and the little red light you might be able to see indicates that an up train is approaching. You'll see that I mentioned the architectural style or designated type of each signal box and the year in which it was built. This is a view uh, of Hamworthy Junction signal box taken some 60 years ago. It's looking a little sorry for itself. The white levers are spares, their functions having been done away with some time ago. Now, Wareham signal box is actually the youngest of the four signal boxes involved. It was built 93 years ago and still stands to this day, but out of use. It controlled the level crossing where the A351 for Swanage crossed the railway line. In summertime, it was very busy with rail and road traffic. And from Andrew Wright, I learned that car drivers would repeatedly try to beat the slowly closing level crossing gates and try to squeeze through. The result was that the edges of the closing gates would scrape the size of the cars, sometimes taking off the wheel hubcaps. For many years, the trophies, that is the hubcaps, were hung up in the signal box above the windows like a dado rail. Nowadays, of course, as you probably know, a bridge carries the road over the railway, but the level crossing is still used by pedestrians. In some boxes, the signalman had his back to the trains as he worked the levers. In others, he faced the trains. Our Swanage Railway has examples of both styles. At Wareham, the box is on the upper side of the line and the signalman had his back to the trains. So on the track diagram, Workbridge Junction is at the nearer end. Now this route was signalled by what is called the absolute block system. And on the block shelf at this end, you can see the Southern Railway standard three position block instrument for the section of line down to wool. I believe that this pattern of block instrument dates back to 1928. So wool was the oldest of the four boxes and was about 130 years old when it met its end. Here the Sigmund faced the trains as he worked the levers. The block signal instrument for the Wareham section is at the nearer end. The black boxes on the block shelf house TV screens to monitor several local level crossings. Wurgroot Junction signal box dates back to the opening of the Swanage Railway in 1885. Its architecture mirrors that of other southwestern boxes in the Bournemouth area of that era. British Railways closed it in 1976, four years after the branch lost its passenger service. Now, I paid an official visit to the box in 1965 whilst on holiday in Swanage. 
Here's a view of the time-honored practice of the engine crew picking up the single line token from the signalman. Of course, this is a traditional practice that we continue on the Swanage Railway to this day. As well as closing four signal boxes, Network Rail carried out some substantial work on the track in October 2012. But I'll let the slides speak for themselves. You will see that four sections of rail are missing from this lovely new facing crossover at the London end of Wareham Station. I understand that this crossover has never been used because of the presence of the manned foot crossing in the foreground, which is where the busy level crossing of the A351 used to be. I will just mention that the 1885 signal box used to stand in the V of the junction, where the two big grey huts are now. Three diesel locos and the Orange Army at work again. The job was completed in December 2012. Now Poole is somewhere left of centre. Wareham station is on the right and you can just see a little bit of worker junction on the extreme right. Wool is out of the picture so the whole of the Dorset Coast panel is quite long. It was commissioned into service on the 19th of May 2014. Wareham's three downsidings are on the left Worker Junction is off screen to the right and the signalers use buttons on the panel to set and lock the routes and clear the signals. You see there are trains uh, shown on the uh, diagram uh, in both up and down platforms. We've now got to the second engineering element that I want to tell you about. Two big jobs for the Swanage Railway's permanent way department. The first job was to repair the slipped embankment sides that you see here on the approach to Furswick from Norden. Well, the solution was to purchase a train load of used ballast from Network Rail. This shot shows the ballast that's been dropped on the upside of the slipped embankment. The tree stumps will help to stabilise it. The next job that our permanent way department carried out was to renew over half a mile of worn out track on the Wurgrit side of BP's former oil and gas sidings at Fursbrook. The problem is, is that the track on the long approach up to the sidings is on a rising gradient of 1 in 78. And BR's diesel locos tended to slip and wear away the railhead when they were shunting heavy trains here. So my next few slides will show you how you go about renewing the track using continuously welded rail, or CWR as it's called in the trade. First, you remove all the old track and the worn out ballast. Then you lay a nice smooth path of new ballast. Then you lay down at the correct spacing, 24 new sleepers for each 60 foot rail length. We make great use of our two road rail vehicles that you see here. 
which can operate equally happily on rails and on rough ballast. Then you lay down the new flat water rails and clip them to the sleepers. Then you weld the rails together into one length over half a mile long. Now at the ends of this long piece of rail, you fit what are called a breather switch expansion joints instead of butt joints held together with fish plates. And these expansion joints allow for several inches of expansion and contraction as the long rails heat up in the summer sun and cool off on a winter's night. The Colas Rail Class 66 brings in a load of nice new ballast in wagons known as auto ballasters. The train proceeds to drop the ballast between the rails in what we call the four foot way and outside the rails in what we call the cess as it slowly travels along. The new deep ballast will hold the track in place as temperatures vary through the year. But it's not as simple as that, of course. Here the empty ballast train has arrived at Cork Castle, where Sigel and Mike Walshaw, that's me, signal the loco to run round its train and return home. The rail is temporarily cut into sections. The rail is then stretched by these tensors to the length it would be at a temperature midway between the hottest summer day and the coldest winter night. The gaps that were cut a short time ago are then welded up using an exothermic reaction which deposit molten steel into the gap. I think the chap in the background is hot footing it out of harm's way. Well that's how continuously welded rail is created. I will leave you to work out why it doesn't snap on the cold night or buckle on a hot day. Now, as its name implies, we use a row rail interchange or RRI uh, to transfer railway vehicles from road transport trailers onto the rails on our railway or vice versa, of course. Most frequently, we talk about locomotives, but the same procedure applies to coaches or even perhaps wagons. Now the problem was that our existing RRI at Norden, situated on the up side of the line and on the Swanish side of the level crossing, was right in the way of where we need to install one of the four barriers for our shiny new level crossing. So it had to go. We replaced it by a new RRI diametrically opposite. That is to say on the downside of the line and on the Wurgert side of the road crossing. Sadly, the ground there was by no means level with the rails, so we had a big earth moving job to do first. 5,000 tonnes. Our neat and environmentally friendly solution was to move the spoil by rail, three wagons at a time, up the line to embankment four and dump it down the embankment sides there. It was then a straightforward matter of laying in the points, a lever frame, a sigil, a headshunt siding and, the ins and inset the track for the new RRI. So here is the very first loco to use the new RRI. So what on earth is a token block signaling scheme, I hear you ask? Well, it's a tra traditional system of working single lines safely uh, by ensuring that one and only one train can be in a section of single line at a time. And some of the electrical signaling instruments were invented way back in the 1870s.
Now here we see tokens being exchanged at Corfe Council Station. The signalman, yes, that's me, is handing up a token to the Corfe Castle uh, for the Corfe Castle to Harmons Cross section of single line, which you can see ahead of the train. The driver, or in fact the fireman in this case, is giving up to me the token for the section from Norton, which the train has now cleared. So we decided to install an electric token system like this for our new section between Norden and Worger Junction on Network Rail's main line, which was then being resignaled. Up to now, we hadn't needed a signal box or cabin at Norden, but with the intention of running a regular service through the new token section, we needed a token cabin to house the token instruments uh, for the two sections that is to say to Corfe Castle and to Worker Junction. What better example to choose for our new token cabin than the London South Western Railway's little hut at Lyme Regis? Here it is, a flat pack put up in a day. Now Tony North was the manager of our signal and telegraph department at the time. Now I should explain that the token cabin will also be the place from which we should control the new level crossing over the road to our car park at Norden. Now despite the fact that the level crossing will use lifting barriers instead of traditional swinging gates, we chose to give our cabin the traditional name of Norden Gates. I mentioned a few slides ago that our new electric key token instruments at Norden and Wareham Station would need to be connected by 10 kilometres of cable. We decided that digging trenches and laying heavy signalling cable for that distance was beyond our resources. So we employed a firm called S&T Cover of Eastleigh to do the work under contract. Here they are at work near Northern. Now this huge drum of cable has been brought to site from its secret storage location on a trailer towed by a road railer. So here the cable is being unwound and laid in the trench which has been dug for it. Now believe it or not, the track hereabouts is actually straight. Where we are, it's dead level on the approach to our bridge over the River Froome, which is behind us. But ahead of us, the track rises at a gradient of 1 in 78 to a summit at Fursbrook. Home Lane Overbridge is just visible in the distance. Now you don't buy 10 kilometres of cable of this size in one length. We bought it in several lengths of up to 2 kilometres which have to be jointed at intervals along the line. Swanage Railway staff can now install the signalling equipment at Corfe Castle, Norden, and at an electrical interface between us and Network Rail, just short of the River Froome Bridge. So here's me wiring up some of the control relays in the relay room at Corfe Castle's signal box. And here is one of our team at Norden Gates installing the key token instrument which will work to Corf Castle signal box. Now this is the refurbished instrument at Norden Gates which will work to the end of the token section which is just short of Worger Junction on the main line. The key tokens for this section are all painted yellow to distinguish them from those of the other three token sections of the line coming up from Swanage. Here in Norden Gates cabin is our shiny new track and signal diagram. Norden station is to the right and Norden Gates cabin and the level crossing are in, are in the centre. The six black lozenges in the track are track circuit lamps that will light up red to show when the various track sections are occupied by trains. 
Below it is what we call the block shelf, fitted up with indicators and switches. The signals controlled from here are electrically powered, so we don't need huge levers to operate them, just little turn switches. Now here's a smashing view of our lovely signal box at Corve Castle. We built this signal box from new and commissioned it into service in February 2005. We had to extend the track and signal diagram in Corve Castle for the extension to Wilgra Junction, which is controlled from here. To the extreme right on the diagram is Wareham Station on the main line, which is controlled from Basingstoke Signaling Control Centre. Northern Station is just above our technician's hands and Corfe Castle Station is to the left. This shapely wooden case houses the controls for the new to token section between Northern Gates and Wergrove Junction. Now, if signaling experts think that it looks like the top of a 19th century Tyler's electric train tablet instrument, then so be it. I've mentioned that the new token section actually runs from Northern Gates to Network Rail's up branch home signal, which is just short of the junction with the main line at Wergrat. Now, the last thing we wanted was for trains to have to stop at the far end of the token section in the wilds of nowhere to drop off or pick up tokens for the section, which would have required a new signal box there. It's for this reason that the token instrument for the far end is actually located a further mile on at Wareham Station, as I will show you in a moment. So what happens when the signalman at Corfe Castle releases a token at Wareham Station for a down train to enter the section to Norden? Well, top left in this photograph of a small part of Dorset Coast Panel at Basingstoke, you can see a lamp labelled Down Swanage Token Out. It will light up to tell the signaller that he can set a route for Northern Gates. Simples. Now it was vital that the teams who have installed the system are not those who will verify the wiring that it's been done correctly and to the approved diagrams. And then when power is switched on, we can gradually test the complete system circuit by circuit. Now at Wareham Station, where the distant token instrument is to be installed, there's nowhere to house it out of the weather. The old signal box was closed in 2014. So we had to buy this chunky galvanized steel cabinet to house it. In fact, we needed two steel cabinets and two token instruments, one for each platform. Here's the one on platform two at Wareham, and there's a similar cabinet on platform one. Now the system was designed so that tokens can be withdrawn from or returned to either instrument. And this was for the convenience of train crews on through trains to Swanage, which would call at platform two on the outward down journey and at call up platform one on their return up journey. At last, after we on the Swanage Railway had tested everything to our satisfaction came the great day when professional testers at Corfe Castle, Northern Gates, Wareham and Basingstoke would test the system. Their job was to check that the system did what it was supposed to do and to ensure that it would not do what it was not supposed to do. The day dawned on Thursday, the 5th of February, 2015. Here, yours truly is being instructed by our tester in charge as to what to do with the token instrument at, at the Northern Gates. Could I break the system? Line side notice boards are part of the system. Here is our tester in charge tearing off some masking tape at Norden. Fully satisfied 
our tester in charge has signed the train register. And I quote, electric token brought into operation between Norton Gates and Wurgert Junction, 1408. Advice to Basingstoke panel, 1412. Standing from left to right, myself, the project manager and project engineer, Alan Greatbatch, our signaling inspector, Dick Spencer, our independent competent person, Peter Horn, who was the duty signalman that day at Corf Castle, and lastly, but not least, Dave Halliwell, our tester in charge. Now it was arranged that the government's rail minister at the time, Claire Perry MP, was to make a trip by special train from Poole to Corfe Castle on the 5th of February, just after our new signalling system had been commissioned. Here she is at Wareham, withdrawing a token for her train to proceed down the branch. And Claire Perry is accompanied by Gavin Johns, chairman of the Swanage Railway Trust. Meanwhile, up at Basingstoke, which I showed you 60 slides ago, here is Claire Perry's special train, the 1 Zulu 15, shown on the Dorset Coast panel, approaching Wurger Junction, with the route set down the branch to Northern Gates. That's the string of white lights. Now, oil was discovered under Pool Harbour and Pool Bay by the British Gas Corporation in 1973 which subsequently became BP. And they decided to extract it and bring it ashore on the south side of the harbour and pipe it to Witch Farm Oil Gathering Station. A new road was built by BP to bring the heavy industrial lorries to the site. The new road would cross the track bed of the long closed and dismantled Swanage branch line just near our present station at Norden. So in 1987, with commendable foresight, we asked BP to install this basic level crossing over the old track bed. 15 years later, in 2002, trains would start to run over this crossing once more. So it's time to tell you how we built a modern level crossing here at Norden Gates. We did some exploratory work first. Whenever we obstructed the road to the oil gathering station, we had to be prepared to clear the road at short notice, should an emergency arise with BP. We can now start making preparations for the new barrier crossing to be installed. There'll be four lifting barriers, each secured to concrete foundations like this. We lay in cable ducts from the barriers and the road traffic lights to the relay room adjacent to Northern Gate's cabin. Uh, we've contracted Schweitzer Electronic of Switzerland to design and install the barrier crossing for us. It's very specialised work. Now before the barriers are lowered, these road traffic lights will show a steady amber light for a few seconds, followed by alternating flashing red lights named wigwags, going wig, wag, wig, wag. The console has lower, raise and stop buttons, etc. And it's placed in the cabin where the crossing keeper has good views up and down the road and a good view of the crossing itself. The Schweitzer technicians have completed the installation of their barrier crossing and hand it over to Mark Woolley, our Project Wareham Director but that does not complete the work at Northern Gates. 
we still have to wire up the two signals that will permit trains to proceed over the new crossing and enter the token section on either side. This involved us in much new work and here's one of our technicians busy installing some of the complicated wiring in Norden Relay Room. This is the down signal on the Wurgler Junction side of the barrier crossing before it was commissioned into service. It will replace the stop board to the left. This is the up signal on the Corf Castle side of the crossing after it had been commissioned. It can only be cleared when our crossing keeper has first set the points to the right of the picture for the crossing rather than for the engine release spur. Two is ensure that the single line from Wurgle Junction is clear of trains and that a token for the section has been released by Corp Councillor Sigelman and is in his hands here at Norden. And lastly, he's lowered the barriers and has checked that nothing is trapped on the line between them. The grey box at the foot of the post is the electric signal machine, which will clear the signal arm. A little red and white shunt signal at the bottom applies only to movements into the engine release spur. This is one of the many wire diagrams that we have wired up. All the wiring has to be checked, of course. The old stop board has now been taken down. And this was the happy conclusion to the upgrading and signaling project that I've described to you today. It extended over a period of some five years. So it's now 2016 and I'll show you just a few of the trains that have used our new signal link taking passengers into the heathlands north of the Corf Ridge. The landscape is totally different to that south of Corf. Now our steamer diesel gardeners gave us a great opportunity to extend our normal Swanish to Northern surfaces into the extension. So here's a visiting Great Western 4200 class number 4247 taking part in our spring steam gala. Now, since there are no sidings or runaround loops on the extension, our trains have to be topped and tailed with a loco on each end. Yep. Uh, now, Southwestern trains ran this special from Salisbury later in April, seen here on its return journey at Northern Gates. By the way, the signal behind it has returned to danger quite automatically. There was no spat. Here's another special, this time from Derby. It's now 2017 and I'll read the poster to you. The company and trust of Swanage Railway hereby give notice that on and from Tuesday the 13th of June 2017, the railway passenger service between Wareham and Swanage will be reintroduced and Corf Castle and Swanage Station will open. Now I should explain that to run this trial service we had to hire in from West Coast Railways a Class 37 diesel loco and a mainline certified set of coaches. It's now 2018 and here's our 
our own mainline certified class 33 climbing the grade from the River Froome towards Firsbrook. You'll notice that she's bringing in her support coach with her. This interesting viewpoint shows the two kilometer straight down to the River Room Viaduct, then up at one in 78 towards the summit at Firsbrook. This innovative summer service involved no less than three reversals en route at Yeovil, at Weymouth and at Wareham. It's now 2019 and I'll show you a sequence of shots of a returning train at Norton Gates on Sunday the 3rd of August 2019. Now, much use is made of the Wurgrit extension so that crew training can take place clear of the heritage services between Norden and Swanage. It's now 2020, and here's our smartly refurbished three car class 171 DMU on a driving train driver training run at Firsbrook in March. Now in the summer of 2020, uh, we offered several spells of overnight accommodation to a brand new Southwestern Railways Class 701 electrical multiple unit train to test its pickup shoe, shoe gear off the juice rail, nicknamed for the electrified uh, supply rail. And this involved me in a couple of night shifts at Corfe Castle Signal Box to release a token for it at Wareham. Here's our conductor driver is withdrawn a token for the train from the token instrument on the down platform that I've released for him. It's now 2021. A loco had to visit the road rail interchange siding at Norden, which is in the section to Norden to Wurgra Junction. So here our, here our masked crossing keeper is checking the diagram for the arrival of the train. He has a little platform to stand on to get him nearer to the level of the driver. And we were erected what we call a token set down apparatus otherwise known as a cow's horn, on each side of the line to facilitate token exchange at speed. Now we submitted our Norden to Wurgrit uh, block signalling scheme to the 2019 National Railway Heritage Awards scheme. It's very pleasing to report that we won the Abellio signalling award. Her Royal Highness, uh, the Princess Royal, made the presentations in London on the 4th of December 2019. Lastly, I must express a huge debt of gratitude to Andrew P.M. Wright, the Swanee Railway's official photographer, for supplying the great bulk of the copyright photographs of Wareham and the Swanage branch that I've shown you tonight. My slide attempts to list all of the photographers whose photographs I've used. <laughs>